This week we're solving another one of the minor, possibly major, problems in the life of a CNC operator with our CNC tool tray. We chose this project as an approachable introduction to digital fabrication, something a wide range of users can understand, customize, and make while still being imminently useful. For this project, we selected VCarve Pro design software as it's highly capable while still being approachable and easy to learn. The first step is to lay out and capture the design. Since we're primarily dealing with existing objects, we'll start by laying them out and tracing them on a large piece of paper. For simple shapes, we'll measure and create the corresponding vectors directly in VCarve. For more complicated shapes, such as the collet wrenches, we'll scan our traced outline and use VCarve's trace bitmap tool and do a little cleanup. Less talking, more cutting. We'll review the project file in more detail later. First, let's see how Sandy's getting on. What do you know? Scrap and score. Maple and walnut. We could use a project board or plywood, though Sammy can thankfully be relied upon to come up with awesome edge glued boards from pieces that would otherwise become scrap. I'll rip the last two strips to be an inch larger than the finished tray so I can fasten it to the spoil board without risking running into the fasteners. Wow, you're so fast. I know. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm sure the glue needs a bit more time to set. I usually let it set overnight. Send it through the planer a few times on each side to even out the board. Now that I have my final material, I double check my material size, my zero origin, particularly zeroing on top of the material or the machine bed. When powering up the machine for the first time, the essential first step is to home the machine. In practical terms, we do this by clearing the initial e-stop by releasing the physical e-stop, pressing the reset button, and hitting the ref all home button in the control software. As the machine relearns the physical locations of each axis, the DRO buttons, right here, turn from red to green. The nice thing about our spoil board project is that I can use the grid pattern and insert dowels to line up the material to the gantry easily. Since we have a specific grain and strips of contrasting wood, it's important that the workpiece is aligned to be parallel to the gantry. And yes, it's a masterpiece, as far as spoil boards go. The MoMA called and they want your spoil board back. <laughs> Sammy's pre-drilling and using wood fasteners to secure the workpiece. With everything set up and verified, it's a good practice to run a pre-cycle start checklist and do a final sweep of the project and toolpath settings. Exactly. This is a critical point, particularly if it's a new program. The first program we run is using the half inch down spiral to do clearing of the pockets. I wonder, could that be the same tool that's included in our CNC router pit set? Hashtag shameless plug. Loading the first G code file will populate the toolpath preview and help validate that we have our zero origin offsets correct. Okay, let's expand on this a bit. Some of you might be wondering though, what is zeroing? Let's take a minute and make sure we talk about this important concept. By using Ref All Home, we ensured that the gantry in each of the axes established a repeatable fixed relationship between the machine coordinates and the table. If our G54 work offsets are zero, then the machine coordinates origin shown in red and the G54 work coordinates origin shown in green would be equal, and all programs would start from the front and leftmost extremes of the machine work envelope. Not a terribly useful place for most projects. Instead, we want to have offset values that move the program origin point such that we can locate our workpiece in a more convenient location. We can do this by manually entering G54 offsets using the Offsets tab, pressing on the Axis DRO button, or better yet, using our dual-sided touch plate. Since this is the first program, we'll use the corner finder feature to locate and align the origin of our program with the front left corner of the board, making sure to change the diameter to match the bit we are using. And click OK. It will first touch down to find its Z axis, then rotate the end mill so that the farthest edge of the cutter will contact the X wall, and rotate again by 90 degrees for the Y axis. Remove the magnetic clip and store the touch plate. With the machine initialized and our work offset set, we're ready to hit cycle start and start the program.
With the clearing program done, I can switch to my next tool, which in this case is the quarter inch ball nose tool. Hey, isn't that tool also in our 10 p CNC router bit set, available from cncrouterparts.com? Why yes, I believe it is. All right. Changing to the 60 degree V-bit, and before you ask, yes, that is available in our 10-piece CNC router bit set. I'll zero the Z and run the V-carve program. And finally, our quarter inch end mill tool to finish the exterior profile. With tabs, right? Yes, tabs are a great way to hold the unsupported finished product to the stock. Otherwise, there'd be nothing left to hold it to the spoil board. Whoa, you're going to town on those tabs. They had a purpose, but now they're in my way. <laughs> We seem pretty pleased with ourselves. Looks like the pencil needs a sharpen. Now we need some handles. I put a rand over to soften the edges of the tray for easy handling. They also make great tab erasers, as Martin likes to say. Before epoxy, I clear out any extra chips and seal the surrounding wood. Why is that? It's to prevent the epoxy from soaking into the grain and will help to create crisp lines. I let the epoxy beat up on the surface and then send it flush. I love that part. It's a great reveal. The round over of the handles would fit snugly in the radius corners of the handle slots. It's worth mentioning that I test fit the handles before gluing them on. I let this sit overnight too. I play a few coats of finish to seal the tray. Ta-da! This has been an extremely useful project to have around. I've used it every day at the CNC machine since finishing it. All right, with the fun stuff over, let's slow things down and take a look back at the project file. The eagle-eyed among you will notice I'm opening it in Aspire, which is fine, as Aspire provides a superset of the functionality available in vCarve. First, I'll collapse the design panel, as I'd like to focus on the machine operation, and that's really represented on the right side with the material setup and the toolpaths. Let's run a preview of the project by using the Preview Toolpaths command and select Preview All Toolpaths. The previews are pretty high fidelity and we can even see the tabs that hold the work pieces in. In fact, here's a quick tip. If I go into the toolpaths that have tabs and temporarily turn them off and reset and re-preview the program, I can now double click and remove the excess material from the preview rendering. It's a nice little feature and very useful if you want to send a proof image to a client. However, for our purposes, we need the tabs, so I'll turn them back on. I'll start my review by working top to bottom on the right side toolpath panel, starting with material setup. And most fundamental, of course, is material thickness. It's important that this value is actual and not representing a nominal material thickness, particularly if you're zeroing to the material surface. Next, I'll make sure I'm happy with the X and Y axis work origin, also known as the XY datum. By convention and convenience, this is typically placed in the front left corner of the workpiece, though if needed it can be configured differently. The Z component of the work origin is special and important enough to get its very own setting. Whether zeroing the router bit to the material surface or the machine bed, the important thing is this setting matches where you place the auto-zero touch plate and zero the Z axis before running the program. The choice of zeroing to the material surface or machine bed can be a matter of preference. And while they do offer unique contrasting advantages, 
This can often be subtle, and generally either will do the job equally well. Before I leave the material setup, I'll make sure I'm satisfied with the Z clearances. The default value is fine for most situations, though if we have exposed clamps or other obstacles, we'd want to make sure that the machine will run clear of them, particularly when repositioning between operations. Now I'll use the tool path summary command to check out the program's overall run times. Intuition will often help identify tool paths with out of range feed rates, either unrealistically high or low. Next up is the tool paths themselves. If this was a new project to me, as this sample file is most likely to you, we'll want to review each toolpath. Starting with the V-carve engraving toolpath. I can see the tool that's being called for, and if I didn't have that specific tool geometry, I could change it here and recompute. I'll also verify that the feeds and speeds are appropriate for my machine type, this tool, and the material I'm work holding. Moving on to the two pocket clearance toolpaths. These use a larger half inch router bit to efficiently remove bulk material. And again, I'll review the step over and feeds and speeds. I'll switch back to the 2D view so we can see the vector selections, shown in the canvas in dotted red for the current toolpath. As I review the second clearance pocket toolpath operation, let's talk about these step over values. As the name implies, step over will determine how much of each pass of the router bit will overlap with the prior pass. For roughing operations, this is usually a much higher value than it would be for finishing or detail work. I'm also checking that the spindle speed parameters are set to reasonable values, as machines using our plug and play spindle will use this value during program execution. If your machine is using a router with an on-body speed control adjustment, you'll need to adjust that manually. Alright, let's also talk about depth of cut particularly when cutting deeper than the radius of the tool. We want to have enough passes not to exceed the target chip load of the tool, while not being so small as to be inefficient and have a program that takes longer to run than it should. Since this is a profile toolpath cutting out our part, we we'll want to make sure we have tabs and that they're appropriately spaced, large enough, and conveniently located, for example, ensuring that they're placed away from tight corners. Now that I'm satisfied with the material setup parameters, the toolpaths, including the feeds and speeds, depth of cut, and step overs, I can now generate the machine G-code program that will run on the CNC machine. Like many things, there are at least two general approaches to accomplish this. We can either export all the toolpaths as one G-code program, or I can break the toolpaths into cohorts organized by sequence and toolpaths sharing the same tool. I think it's generally safer and easier to export multiple files and load the next one after changing the tool, particularly for one-off projects like this. Regardless of which approach you choose, make sure you select the CNC Router Parts Post Processor and go make some chips. This project is completely customizable. If you're interested in making your own, check out our links in the video description. Thanks for watching.